So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, you're welcome. We are going to look at dynamic performance. Now, remember the efficiency, and I want you to please put this down. Efficiency is performance at a time. Performance at a time. So let's say a time like one year. You look at the performance of all the banks. In one particular year, you benchmark each one against the other. That is efficiency, performance at a time. Now listen, productivity change, productivity change is performance over time. And I know Dinah is learning some things here. Productivity change, and we don't say productivity. You say productivity change, or you say dynamic productivity, which means it's productivity change. So efficiency is static performance. Productivity change is dynamic performance. So we are not looking at how well you were last year. No, we are looking at how well you were last year relative to this year. That's what we are looking at. How well you were last year relative to this year. That is productivity. That is productivity change. Okay. I hope you understand. Okay. And one measure that we are going to look at in assessing productivity, there are different measures of productivity. We'll be looking at them. Okay. For now, we'll be looking at three indices or three ways of assessing dynamic productivity. Three ways of assessing productivity change. The first one is known as the MAMQUIST productivity change. The second is known as the global MAMQUIST productivity change, so, or the global frontier shift, to be precise. And then the other one, which is more of not time dynamics, but group dynamics, is the meta frontier analysis. But guys, relax, relax, relax. I want you to relax. <laughs> relax. Let's go slightly slower to begin to understand what an index is. What is an index? What is an index? Okay. Now, in the world, an index is basically like a tool that is used to compare relative performance of something. Okay. Now, sometimes a person might look at an index as, you know, a, you know, alphabetical subjective way of, of looking at something in terms of books, okay, index. But that is not the sort of index that I'm talking about. I'm talking about an index, which is the tool for assessing performance. That tool for assessing performance. You know, sometimes we call it an indicator or a measure of something. In the world of finance, sometimes it talks more about statistical measure of change in the security market. You know, that is sometimes how we look at it. You know, that indicator, for example, when we talk about several indices, they normally measure the performance of the basket of you know, stocks intended to replicate a certain area of the market. So sometimes in, in finance, we talk about the standard and poor's 500 index. Dow Jones Industrial Average Index, you know, um, and several things like that. But the index we're looking at here, guys, is a tool. Now, the word index has a plural, which is indexes or indices. None of them is wrong. And so we are looking at using a tool to compare different sets of data, economic data, over time, over time. Okay. They are usually constructed by taking a harmonic mean or weighted average of different series of data. And the reason why sometimes using an index is good is that it can help you to better compare something. There are several kinds of indices. Some of you will know the consumer price index, the producer price index. Okay. Sometimes when you listen to the news, you hear of the share of the market index. You may hear of that. Yeah. The stock exchange, they'll tell you the total share 
The labor cost index is there. The GDP deflator is an index. The Las Payes and the Pachés and the Fisher index, the Convex, the Manquist, all of these are indices. Okay. We can talk about price indices. We can talk about quantity indices. So that's an index. Now the index that we are going to look at here in terms of performance is the Mamquis Productivity Change Index. Now, sometimes you see some books talk a lot about Mamquis Productivity Index, Productivity Index, but there is a change. And I want you to understand that it's a change because there is, a, there is from one time to another time, dynamic productivity. This Mamquist Productivity Change Index was named after Professor Stan Mamquist, okay, and is a bilateral index that is used to measure productivity change. Now you can use it to assess productivity change over time and across two countries or across two entities, not just over time, but not just across time, but across individuals. So, so in terms of regression, if you were ever done regression, you will notice that in regression, we talk about cross-sectional regression. And then we talk about panel data regression. This is like panel data regression analysis. Mm -hmm. That is it. So we are looking at dynamic performance. It deals with efficiency studies over time. Okay? But the key point is that this normal efficiency will look at snapshot of performance at a point in time. Normal efficiency. Even if you measure efficiency okay, and you group all of them together, it is still at a point in time that you are trying to average. But then the Marcus Productivity Index considers performance dynamics across different time periods. And that is what we are going to examine for this course. So what I'm going to do now is to give you a bit of history about the, the Mamquist Index. It was pioneered by Shepard in 1953 and Mamquist in 1953. They were doing their work separately. Um, whilst one was doing it in the world of distance function, okay, the other was doing it in the world of you know, indices, okay, in the world of um, quantity index, whilst the other was doing it in the world of um, price indices. So, so distance functions, as we know, we can use distance function, and you guys have used distance function already in efficiency analysis. We can use distance function in a number of ways. The Las Paez in 1871 uses a distance function. The Higgs most in the index by Diwet in 1992 uses distance function. So distance function is used a number of times. Distance function Okay, if you have done something related to vectors and matrices, we deal a lot with distances. And that is a principle there. Now, how did the Mamquist come into, into the world? Well, first of all, it was named after Professor Mamquist in 1953, but he really wasn't the one that actually propounded the theory. But his ideas were used by caves. Christensen and Diwet in 1982, CCB. Okay. And they developed that theoretical in this, in terms of distance function. So they use the distance functions of the Mamquist, and of course with Shepard, and then developed that theoretical index, which is called the Mamquist index. But you see, these guys, Caves, Christensen, and Diwet they did not employ linear programming into the picture. They didn't. Now we know that DEA was introduced by Charles Cooper and Rhodes in 1978. And it was also extended by Banker, Chance and Cooper. We know that. But they actually, actually adopted activity analysis idea from Farrell. And they use linear programming to develop DEA, which we know, we understand that. So DEA is a non-parametric linear programming frontier methodology for assessing the relative efficiency of decision-making unit. Now, that knowledge of linear programming and Cape's idea of 
the bilateral index. This was copied or it was borrowed by Fair Groskop Lindgren and Ruse in 1992. This gentleman, okay, and lady from Oregon State University, okay, together later, two years later, perfected by Fair Groskop, Norris and Zan, they connected that Pharrell idea of activity analysis the Charles Cooper and Rose idea of linear programming in DEA and the Christensen, you know, um, um, Caves, Christensen and Dywet's idea of bilateral index. And they combined all of this and introduced this DEA based MAMQUIS productivity change index. The history is, is beautiful. Okay. And, and I know that bulk. Professor Ball has actually written a beautiful story about this history. You know, it's a beautiful history. You got to know where the thing is coming from before you use it, else you use it wrongly. You got to appreciate the brains behind it. And once you do that, you begin to now understand it and you can expand it. You can extend it even, and then add your own things to it, which we have done. So, the Mamquist index was defined originally as a quantity index. It is the ratio of distance functions. So you're going to see ratios here a lot, okay? Where a couple of observations are assessed relative to an indifference scale. I say indifference scale because it was a quantity index. That's what Mamquist did. Then he worked in the consumer theory. So if you know indifference scale, okay, that is in the consumer theory. And then Chris, um, Capes, Christensen, and Dywet, they substituted the technology not with an indifference scale. Okay? They replaced that indifference scale and defined a productivity change index in the spirit of that consumer quantity index. And so now they are kind of moving it to a producer theory analysis. And, and the survey, the entire story is written by Tone. In 2004, in his book, he directed the story, okay, the survey of this Mamquist Index to the operational research audience. And FAIR, we call it a red book, the very popular red book in 2008, FAIR et al. have also written it for economists. Now, again, you get a theory in all of this. It's a beautiful work. I love it. Now, this is all in the spirit of non-parametric. You remember we said that they use the DEA-based you know, approach to be able to come out with a MAMCOS, which we are going to work with. But it's all in non-parametric. Remember, this started in 1992. Okay? But before then, Nishimizu and Page had introduced a MAMCOS productivity change in the, in the parametric framework using a stochastic frontier analysis. Now this hasn't gained much root, okay? Because a non-parametric, as we have seen already, is flexible and allows the data to speak for itself. And that is why many people. It was after 10 years on this, that FAIR, Groskov, Lindgren, and Roos introduced the, the non-parametric, the DEA-based MAMQUIS index. Now the difference between FAIR, Groskov, Lindgren, and Roos approach and this again is good for you guys, mate. When you are writing your methodology and when you are extending these models, okay, and, and when you know the differences in it. Because fair gross call, fair gross call, they appeared in both papers, 92 and 94 papers. Lengren and Ruse and Norris and Zan, you know, vanished from the two papers. The difference you will see later is that the second paper, the 1994 paper, extended the first one by decomposing the original efficiency change into pure and scale efficiency change. That's all, you know. So it showed the decomposition. But then the first one, the 1992 one, it had only two decomposition, efficiency change and technological change, okay? And, and, and measured a MAMQUIST under CRS, but then, the MAMQUIS can be measured under VRS, which the 1994 paper showed 
how the MAM quest can be measured under both CRS and VR, which means that we now have a pure efficiency and then a scale part, something we already know from normal efficiency studies. Now, two different versions of the MAM quest are very available in the literature. Okay. The first one is adjacent MAM quest by Fair, Groskopf, Norris, and Zan, that we have spoken about. It's the most commonly used. Um, it's not just applicable for adjacent time periods, you can even apply it to periods that are not adjacent. So it's not just measuring the productivity change between 1991 and 1992, and 1992 and 1993, and 1993 and 1994. No, you can look at years that are not even adjacent to each other. So you can look at the productivity change between 1992 and 2002. Okay, what is the dynamic productivity between the two? Yes. And so that is adjacent index. Then there is a base period index by my senior professors, you know, in, in you know, those Scandinavian countries, Berg, Fossan, and Janssen, okay, which is we are going to use. And, and that one is not that much popular though, but it's still very good because that one, the idea is that you only measure the performance relative to a base period. So you can identify one of the years, let's say 1992 to 2002, you identify one of the years as a base period. Maybe 1992 is the base period. And you measure everybody relative to that base period. Okay. Some people like that, but that is not that much commonly used. So the one we are going to study is the adjacent MAMQuest index. And I've given you an example, measuring 2000, 2001, Okay, 1999, 1991, you know, uh, but the base period, okay, you compare all of those years relative to one base period. And that is the base period MAMQUIS productivity change. Now, here's an interesting thing. Since that time, what time? Since the time of 1992 and 1994 extension of the MAMQUIS, there have been different reformations, different extensions, additions, removals, and things. Okay, Ray and Desley indicated that the, the MAM quest that was introduced by Fair, Groskopf, Norris, and Zan has some problems, okay? Has some problems. And those problems, uh, it happen when you measure the MAM quest relative to a VRS frontier. And so they brought a different decomposition of the MAM quest under the VRS. Shastalova introduced a sequential mam quest. O introduced the sequential mam quest to Luenbegar index. Okay. And then in 2005, Pastor and Labor brought about a global mam quest, which is slightly different from the one by Asma and Tam that focused on the global frontier shift, which led also to something they called global mam quest. But the focus was on the global frontier shift. Then all of these had problems with infeasibilities. Infeasibilities will happen when you measure an efficiency of a firm relative to the frontier, but the frontier cannot be found. The firm cannot be measured against the frontier because the frontier cannot be found. And this will normally happen when you are estimating the cross period efficiencies or the mixed period efficiencies or the intertemporal efficiency. And so this, this mixed period infeasibilities was a big problem. And you see that later on. And so Pastor, Asmal, and Lavelle came together and introduced the Biennium Amquist to handle infeasibilities and solve two other issues. Oh, in 2010. In, and Shen in 2011 brought about a meta frontier Mamquist index. So now you have the Mamquist index but now you create a meta frontier around these indices. And then Absharan and R that also brought about the overall mam quest index. So this is just to tell you that there have been a lot of the extension. And guys, as I speak, there is an extension of the mam quest going on in this class as well. So what are the advantages of the mam quest productivity index? Well, first of all, since it's coming from DEA, all the advantages of the DEA will, will come in here. Okay. It measures total factor productivity change. And DEA can handle multiple inputs and multiple outputs with minimal assumption without information on even the input and output prices. 
DEA allows the data to speak for itself. So that can also happen. And we know that in DEA, you can de decompose the performances. So here, you can decompose productivity change into different you know, factors like catch up effect, frontier shift effect, and several other effects later on. So that's also another, why, why is this an advantage? It's an advantage because, because if you know the sources of the productivity change, it can help you to know what is driving the dynamic performance. I'll give you an example. Suppose your car is running, okay? And then there is a problem. And then when the problem was solved by the mechanic, he doesn't tell you what the problem was. Now that is a bit of a, because you later realize that you could have solved the problem yourself. So you got to know whether the problem is coming from the engine, the oil, okay? Whether it's coming from the, 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 the ties, what, is, what specifically is the source? Once you know the source, you can remedy the problem later on next time. So the source is important. Suppose I bring a certain food down, okay? You want to know the source of that meal, the ingredients that came together to form that. So decompositions are important in Manquist productivity analysis. And then of course, since we are looking at dynamic performance, we can identify trends and patterns using this Manquist productivity. I'm just going through the theory for you to appreciate it, okay? So that we'll do the practicals next time. So let's look at this. And I want, this is a quick one, okay, for you to appreciate this. Now, what you see here are two frontiers. We have an output on the Y axis and then input on the left axis, on the bottom axis. And guys, when you look at this very carefully, you will notice something here. You will notice that we have the frontier B, which is a straight line and it's a green line. And then the frontier A is a blue line. All of them are straight straight because this is under the constant returns to scale. In a constant return to scale, the constant returns technology is a straight, straight line. It's not piecewise, piecewise line. Okay, it's not a convexity assumption here. Okay. Now look at that. When you look at these, you will see that this frontier was created by the green observation. Those that are on the extreme left, they make up the frontier. And then when you look at this blue frontier, it was created by the extreme observations, the star style blue ones. But those that are on the extreme left created a frontier. Now you can see that those that are on the frontier will be efficient. Those that are not on the frontier will be inefficient at that particular time. Now, but what is the difference between the frontier A and B? The frontier A will represent a time period, okay? That is like time period one. And the frontier B will represent time period two. So frontier A can be the year 2000. And frontier B can be the year 2001. In this case, the frontier B is behind the frontier A. In other words, the frontier B is enveloping the frontier A. Remember, this is an input on the X axis and output on the Y axis. Now, when a firm is away from the frontier, that firm is inefficient in that particular time period. When the firm is closer on the frontier, the firm is efficient. It is on the frontier. The gap between the two frontiers is what is known as a frontier shift. And you can see that that gap is not necessarily, you know, um, parallel. Okay, you can see that it is, it is bigger in some portions and smaller in another portion. We'll come back to some of these things. Okay. So how do you estimate the frontier, the MAMQUIS productivity index, theoretically? I'm just do, using the table I've drawn, the, the, the information. Well, take this, take note of this. The Malmquist productivity change in this is made up of four different efficiency scores. It's made up of four different efficiency scores. And it is how those efficiency scores are estimated that leaves us with different, different results. 
So once you get those different, different results for those four efficiency scores, you use this formula, which will, I'll give a practical name for it later on, to be able to, to find the score. Okay, and then once you get a score, you now get the efficiency. Now the theta, because I'm going to focus on input orientation, you guys can remember that in an efficiency, theta, we use theta to represent input efficiency scores. We use a five to represent the output efficiency scores. So that's theta A, B, where the A is the time period one and the B is the second time period. What this is saying is that the theta is the efficiency score, the technical efficiency score. Okay. For observation in time period B, you can see I'm mentioning the B first. In time period B, okay, relative to the frontier in period A. So guys, the second number is a time period observation in that time period. And then the first letter represents the frontier in which that observations performance or efficiency is being measured relative to, or is being measured against, okay? Now, when we come to the practical, 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 I like the practical one, that makes it clear. So in the literature, we use that data, okay, to define the input distance function, which is typically the inverse of the, or the reciprocal of the technical efficiency scores. Now, this point is, is important. We'll talk about it again later though. But the key point is that distance function and efficiency scores are reciprocals of each other. Put that down. Distance function and efficiency scores are reciprocals or inverse of each other. The DEA efficiency scores was in the spirit of Farrell, 1957. The distance function, you got to know, okay, from, from Shepard or the Mamquist is 1953. So, so those, the distance function is the opposite of the efficiency scores. So what is being spoken here is that when you are estimating the score, you can choose to use efficiency scores or you can choose to use the distance function score, but be consistent. Once you choose to use the efficiency scores, go efficiency scores all the way. And once you are using distance function, use distance function all the way. They will have different interpretation. That is why you have to stick to which one you want to and go along with it. Another point to note before we start the practicals is that observations in a particular time period, say time period B, can be located outside the frontier A, not frontier B, the frontier A. And this will lead to something we call super efficiency score. Let me take you back here. We'll do all this, don't worry. Okay. Now look at the green observations. All the green observations are inside the green frontier. None of them is outside the, 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 the green frontier. Okay. But look at the blue observations. The blue observations are all of them also inside the blue frontier. Okay, they are inside the blue frontier. However, you can have a green frontier Oh, sorry, a green observation, one of these dots. You can have one of the green observations, okay? You can have one of these green observations located outside the blue frontier. Uh -huh. Even though some of them are located inside, okay, as you can see, are located outside the blue frontier. Now, when you are located outside a particular frontier, that frontier cannot see you because the frontier was created by the extreme fence, but now you are outside extreme. So whenever a particular frontier, and normally your own observations cannot be, allocated, cannot be located behind you, behind your frontier, because you are the one at the limit. You, the efficient firm, you are the limit. But then another year's fence, another year's observation can be located outside a particular frontier like you have just highlighted you know, in this situation. And when that happens, whenever you estimate these scores relative to these blue frontier, because it's not on the frontier or inside the frontier, 
the blue frontier will estimate them as being super efficient. Okay? So they, they, these will be super efficient, be relative to this blue frontier, to be super efficient. And that is the point of super efficiency. So in an input-oriented situation, this will be given a score of what is known as greater than one. Now remember, in an input orientation, okay, as you guys might remember, if you don't remember, I just want to remind you, in, 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 in an input orientation, you know that when uh, theta, if you have theta, okay, theta is actually less than one if the firm is what? Inefficient, you all know that. And theta is equal to one if the firm is what? Efficient, do you remember? Fantastic. And now we are saying that theta for that particular firm will be greater than one if the firm, if that observation is super efficient. Okay. So in this case, the maximum is one, but that firm is behind you. And so that score becomes a super efficient score. Now listen carefully, even though this is preliminary. It is from these super efficient scores. Okay. It is from these super efficient scores that one of them can be infeasible. It is from these super efficient scores that one of them will exhibit infeasibility. In other words, yes, you are behind me, but sometimes I can't see you. It's not all the time, but sometimes you're behind me, I can see you. But sometimes you're behind me, I can't see you. So in this case, from the super efficiency scores, you can now have mixed period infeasibilities. That's what you can have, mixed period infeasibilities. And that is one of the challenges of the existing MAMQUEST productivity estimation. If, so sometimes we say that that particular observation is infeasible and the software as well realize that and they will give you an infeasible score, a no score. But then once it gives you a score greater than one in this context, then it means that that particular score or that firm is a super efficient firm. Okay, if you have any question on this, please raise your hand and then I can address that nicely for you. Okay. So this, this, this is an important point. That is why I had to you know, explain it further for you. All right, now the Manquist, as you can see, I told you that the Manquist is made up of four efficiency scores. This is the first one, okay. Then this is the second one. There are differences in them, and the difference has to do with whether you have been, this score is being measured relative to which frontier, okay, across or you know, within. Okay, we'll look at the details later. But you can now decompose the frontier, the Manquis index. You can decompose this adjacent Manquis productivity index into one efficiency change, which is also called catching up, and then technological or technical change, which is also called frontier shift. Now, it is the same efficiency scores that you got that you are going to use to help you to do the decomposition. Okay. So the first one, the efficiency change is the theta. You can see that they are all having the same period period okay, over the second one, which is also the same period period, AA. But when it comes to the technical change, you will notice that even though you have the own period, own period efficiency scores, you also have cross period efficiency scores. Okay. And the cross periods are the one that have two different you know, years okay, attached to each other. We'll look at the practicality of all of it. Now, it is the technical change or the technological change that you take the square root of. Now, please know that of, of course, the original MAMQuest, it is the square root okay, of those ratios that we had there. The original MAMQUIS is a square root of four different efficiency scores ratio together. And when you decompose it, that, that part goes to the technical change, which will have the square root or the geometric mean. Okay. So in this case, you take the geo mean that you find the score for the frontier shape. What is this frontier shape? What is this? I'll talk about them practically when we get to the realities. Okay. But the key for now, just know that the, the catching up deals with the ability of the firm to get closer to the frontier. 
Okay, so so pension now has to do with it's a, it's an efficiency change, and because it's an efficiency change, it refers to managerial performance. It is it's managerial efficiency over time. In other words, you want to know whether managers are helping the firm to move their efficiency score from a point to a point. Let me give you an example. Let's say that a particular firm has a score of 80% this year, okay? And, and it, that means that a firm is inefficient. But next year, the subsequent year, the firm has a score of 90%. It is still inefficient, but is a firm not improving? Uh-huh. So the firm may not have been 100% efficient, but the firm is improving, improving. And you always want firms to what? Improve. So that improvement in efficiency, you attribute it to improvement in the managerial acumen. So it means the managers are doing well. Even though in both years separately looking at them, the, the firms are inefficient. But imagine a particular firm is efficient, 100% today. And then next subsequent year, that firm is still efficient, 100% tomorrow. Has the firm improved? No. So even though the firm is again efficient in both periods, the firm has not improved. But in productivity change analysis, you are looking at improvement, not stagnation. Mm -hmm. So improvement is more important. But I know that you might be saying that, oh, but when you are 100%, then how do you improve again? Okay. Then it means that you got to now find a way to make that firm not fully 100%, because there must be a possibility of improvement. And that is what the, the, the efficiency change in this context, you attribute it to managerial performance. Now, then you have the front end. So this is efficiency change formula. Okay? It is the second year, the score of the second year divided by the score of the first year. Now, if the firm is closer to the frontier in the period B than it was in the period A, then we say that the catching up index is less than one for input orientation. In other words, the DMU is catching up to the frontier. Uh, okay, but if it is greater than one. That is if the efficient, because the, the productivity change must be equal to one, less than one, or greater than one. Now, if it's greater than one, what it means is that that particular DMU is losing grounds relative to the frontier of best performance. Okay. So it means that the others are improving more. Now, please note that this is input orientation, input orientation. If it is output orientation, the scores change and the meanings also go opposite. Okay. If it is output orientation, sorry, the score will remain the same, but then the opposite interpretation will be different. In other words, if you have a catching up index of greater than one in an output orientation, it means that that firm has improved. But in an input orientation here, it means that the firm is deteriorating in performance. Okay. And so other firms are doing better. That's the point here. All right, so this is how we can illustrate the performance measurement. Now, the efficiency, and this is important, and this is all theory, okay? Listen, to this is all theory. We'll look at the practicalities later. Okay. Now, if you have, if you have a firm whose performance you are trying to measure, okay, let's say that DA, a firm called D, and you're trying to measure performance, but the performance is relative to its frontier, okay? Because that firm, its performance is being measured relative to that same firm's frontier, that efficiency is known as own period efficiency. Own period efficiency, okay? So you can have the firm D, but the firm D is in two periods. One is in period A, and another is period B, okay? Now, when you measure that same firm period B, but relative to frontier B, that is the same frontier, this is known as own period efficiency score. That's if you're using efficiency scores. If you're not using efficiency score, you're using distance function, which is a reciprocal of the efficiency score. You call it own period distance function. 
Uh, it is this one, these two. Okay, after you've measured how you are relative to your current year, how you are relative to your next year, it is this ratio that you put together to form the catching up index or the efficiency change index. Efficiency change. Efficiency change. Okay. If you have a question at any point, just let me know. Okay. So let's say that you estimate the efficiency okay, of a particular firm to be 40%. Okay. And that is relative to its own frontier A. And then you do that same firm, but this time the firm is in year two. You know, you can have Ronaldo in 2008, and you can have Ronaldo in 2018. That same Ronaldo will be different. It will be different in performance. His performance will be different because we are now in different time period. Now, how do you know whether Ronaldo has improved? Well, you look at Ronaldo's performance in 2018, which is in this case, this purple one. Here. And then you compare, so Ronaldo's performance in 2018 is 50%. Okay. So now I just want to write that down to help you to focus. Okay. And then, so you have 50%. Then Ronaldo's performance in 2008, as you can see in the first one, is what? That one is 40%. So you do 50% divided by 40%. Okay. Now, this is going to be the efficiency change. The efficiency change, okay, is now the ratio of the own period efficiency for the second year divided by the own period efficiency for the first year. Okay. And when you look at this score, okay, you're now going to have a score of 1.25. Okay, that's efficiency change score. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that, okay, and again, even though I told you guys that when the score is greater than one like this, it means uh, in an input orientation, it means that the firm is, 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 is deteriorating. Okay? We, we tend to convert them all into greater than one so that you get all the scores. Okay? So, so in an input orientation, you can take the reciprocals of all the scores so that you can better explain them. Because it's quite nice if you're explaining something greater than one as higher, than less than one as higher. So you do that, and that will still come back to the, the beautiful interpretation. So on the basis of that, if the efficiency score here is greater than one, it means that the firm is progressing or improving. And what you can say is that for this particular firm D, the firm D has improved. That's what you're going to say. These, these words are important because when you're writing your thesis, you're going to, okay, firm D has improved its efficiency by 25%. Okay. So you take the extra and that extra becomes the improvement factor. So it's improved its performance by 25%. This means that in, the, in this context of efficiency change, it means that managers have been able to do better by 25% compared to the previous year. Okay. So in both years, the firm was inefficient, 40% inefficient, 50%. But then when you look at the efficiency change, you can see that the firm is improving. That's why productivity change analysis is important, okay? Because efficiency change will not, efficiency, normal efficiency analysis will say that, oh, this firm is not doing well. But productivity will tell you, hey, hang up. You don't see what is happening. There is a gradual improvement happening, okay? So that is how you estimate efficiency change for this particular firm in this case. Okay. Now, question is, so, so you can see how this thing was calculated, okay? And I took the reciprocal, okay? And then you have, but then it still come back to the interpretation. If you are taking this one without taking the reciprocal, okay, it becomes a bit difficult to interpret it unless you have a few understanding. But because I took that 125, it makes the interpretation being, you know, improvement, it makes it very, very nice. Now, so this shows that the firm is exhibiting positive efficiency change. 
even though it is inefficient in both periods. Now, how do you now calculate the second decomposed element, the frontier shape? The question now becomes this, how much would FM in the FEM D, in other words, let me use Ronaldo again. How much will Ronaldo in 2008 think that think the frontier has improved between 2008 and 2018? In other words, if Ronaldo in 2008 is jumped, okay, his mind, his physical ability, everything, if he's thrown into the year 2018, how do you think that he was, oh, oh the, come on, the frontier has improved. Now, what is this frontier? The frontier is what he was being benchmarked against. The one he was being benchmarked against, that gave him the 40%, okay? And now he has been moved. It would have saved 40% characteristics into the second year. How would he think? How would he perceive the frontier, okay? The difference between Ronaldo being projected onto the frontier A and on frontier B. That difference is what is known as the technical change index. That is a frontier shift. Okay, so how would you think if you take Ronaldo in 2018, this is an opposite one. You take Ronaldo in 2018, you dump him in 2008. Oh, he is gonna blow so many things because now he's improved so much. So he's going to dribble, he's going to do so many things. He will dribble one way from the one end of the pole to the other end of the pole because he's so expert. So how the, the, the firm sees itself in two time periods helps. Let me give you an example. You know the world Pele, okay? During his time, he probably was able to dribble a lot of the time. He dribbles and dribbles. He's dribbling everybody, dribbles the goalkeeper and dribbles the goal. <laughs> It drills everything. But if you bring that guy into our current dispensation, that guy cannot dribble because he is now facing a different frontier. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so this helps us to be able to calculate the technical, the technological or the technical change is the square root of the four indices that you see here. And this is a frontier shape. Now, practically, what is this frontier shift? The frontier shift, okay, don't worry about this one because this one is just putting everything together now. Okay. That's all. Okay. This is the entire mom cost. Okay. The frontier shift, what is that? Okay. Now, this frontier shift is, and I want to take you back here. The frontier shift here talks about an invisible technological dynamics. That is making this particular firm behave in a certain way, which is outside the management control. So this, this is what we call an industrial change, okay, which may come as a result of process or product innovation in the industry. In the industry. So, so let's assume that taking back again into the footballer. Now, the movement of Moronaldo from 2008 to 2018. It's a big move. You can see he's improved and all of that, okay? which is as a result of his own doing. But what if this gentleman has improved because the entire industry, the industry of football itself has improved or that team, the industry of teams, different teams, uh, because of UEFA games, because of other competitions, because of you know, Olympic games, because of technological advancement. No, it's helped this person now to do better, not out of his own free will, but because the entire technology outside of him is doing well, he has to take advantage of that and plug himself into the system that is doing well. And then he becomes better. He's getting better and better, not because of his own doing, but because the industry itself is doing well. And so he takes advantage of the technological spillovers. A person can be very bad naturally. Or let's say a person can be not that smart. A student can be not that smart. But you can take that student from where he's not smart and dump him into Harvard University. 
But the environment of Harvard University does not warrant that that person becomes lazy. So out of the person's old, if it was the person himself, he wouldn't have really learned the way he's learning. But Harvard has put certain measures, certain systems, certain innovations, certain R&Ds into place. The lecturers, the books, the computers, all of these things are making this person now looking good, learning well, and getting smarter and smarter, which are outside the control. But if those things were not there, if those dynamics, those industrial dynamics, those external factors were not there, the person wouldn't have been good. So what, we, what this technical change is trying to do is to measure how well are you taking advantage of the factors outside of you? This time, not out of your own managerial acumen, not out of your own, but external to you. How are you taking advantage of that? How are you doing well because the industry is doing well? And you'll be surprised. Some people will still not do well, even if the industry is doing well. Some people will not do well. You will dump them from you know, situation that will meet a certain environment, they will not do well. And some people will even be in a bad environment and they will do well. And that is what this technical physical assess. Okay. Now, before we wrap up the theory, okay, before we wrap up the theory, let's look at a point on returns to scale. Guys, do you remember I told you that the MAM quiz or the normal DA, you measure it against constant returns to scale and then what? Variable returns to scale. You remember that? Okay. Do you remember that? If you remember that type, yes. I want to be sure that you are with me. I want to be sure that you are engaging with me. Okay. If you are with me, type yes. Do you remember that? McClay, good. Do you remember that? I need replies. Okay. I want you to type yes if you can hear me. If you can hear me, type yes. Okay. Do, precious, good. Okay. Who else? Kajitan, good. Eunice, yes. Okay. Janet, yes. Okay. I want to hear you type because I want to be sure that you are with me. Okay. All right. So this helps me to know that those who are actually with me. Okay, that's it. This is a proof. All right. So the constant return to scale is where, where the technology is constant. I mean, you can see it is constant technology. So I'll give you an example. Okay. Suppose you have something like this. You have a particular X. Y like this, and then another one which is X like that. Okay, and then you are trying to draw the constant returns to scale. The constant returns to scale graph is straight like that. Okay, that's constant return. Now the variable returns to scale it goes piecewise. That one goes a bit like this. Okay, a bit like that. Okay, a bit like this, and then a bit like that. Okay, something like this. So this one, this curvy, curvy one. This one is a VRS constant, a VRS retention scale, variable retention scale technology. And this one is a CRS technology. Okay. And this technology, you can use any one of them to measure the MAMQUES productivity change index. So let's say that you have a particular firm here okay, and you are trying to measure the productivity of that particular firm. Now, how do you measure it? You look at the distance in an input, input orientation. You can look at the distance it is relative to the frontier. Okay. So this distance is going to help you to be able to know how far it is. Now you can see that it hits the VRS frontier here. Okay. And then it hits the CRS frontier there. Okay. So, so the score you are going to get will be different relative to which technology frontier you are dealing with. Now, the Manquist, according to Ray and Desley, okay, and other people like Pastor and Lavelle and all, okay, should generally be calculated under the CRS, even if the true technology is VRS. I want to repeat that. Okay. Now, that was the original statement, that a Manquist should be calculated under the CRS, even if you know the technology is VRS. Now, right now, of late, we can test the technology. And most of you who are doing your research, you, you are able to do that. Dinah has tested the technology. And in her case, she found out that the technology is VRS. 
Now, according to Ray and Desley and others, even if the technology is VRS, still use CRS. Why? And the answer was because, and Dana has faced that problem, okay? Because the VRS will bring about a mixed period infeasibilities. The mixed period efficiency scores are guaranteed only when there is a well-behaved CRS frontier. But if it is under VRS, you will experience infeasible DMUs scores. But if it is under CRS, there is no problem. See, the reason is because if you have two firms and one is behind this guy, okay, if one is behind this guy, okay, let's say this. Okay, there's a particular firm here. Okay, there's a particular firm at this point here. And then you are trying to measure this point relative to your VRS function. Now the VR and it, and it is, you are doing it in an output orientation way. Okay? In an output orientation, you have to go vertical, so you will not hit. We'll look at invisibility later. It will not hit in the frontier, because the frontier is this red one there. And so when that is the case, then it means that that score will not be obtained. So that is why they suggested that focus on using the CRA. But I'm afraid we have dealt with that problem. I've told you about the binary monkeys that have dealt with that problem. And so this wouldn't be a big deal. But in, in, in a situation when you are doing cost productivity, which is what she was doing, okay, and that cost productivity, you don't have a VRS version of it. So you don't have a binary MomQuest version of that. And the technology is still VRS. Then it means that you will still have infeasibility issues if you are using VRS. Okay. Diana, do you know that if you were to use, if you were to use, um, what do you call it? Do you know that if you were to use VR, sorry, CRS, you wouldn't have the infeasibility, are you aware? Yeah, yes, Doc. Uh -huh. You wouldn't have infeasibility issues if you were to use CRS. Okay. But your technology was saying that you should use VR because you tested it under the non-parametric test of returns to scale using yeah. Sima and Wilson test. So it means that you either develop, you come out and develop a VRS, you know, or a biennial cost mammogram productivity index properly, which you will do. You will do yeah. today. <laughs> okay. You will do because from what you've done already, you can do that because now you've been able to prove that you can estimate this one under the Wheeler and Wilson approach. However, you can do it. The only thing is that you have to take your time and model it in a small data set. Then we work it out and then build it further and then we develop it. And of course, there are several ones that you can develop once you are able to do that, okay? Now, imagine you solving that problem in cost. Do you get a point? It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a big, big you know, extension of the Maniadaki and Tanasolis uh, paper. Yeah. So, guys, that is what these guys suggested, that it should be done. Okay. Uh, but like I said, you will do the CRS if that is what it is. Now, the, 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 the other good thing about the VRS is that it can help you to decompose the MAMQUIS into the skill component. And there are so many disagreements in the literature when it comes to this skill component. We haven't solved it yet. And so majority of papers, you know what they do? They use this one, the fair Groskop, Norris, and Zan one. And few now use Ray and Desley decomposition. Okay. There is another decomposition by Wheelock and Wilson, which very few people, probably, probably not even up to five papers in the world, are using that. And this is where we extend it in several areas of the, of the literature. Okay. But there are three main decompositions of this. In fact, there are several, actually, not three. Okay. There are several others. Okay. But these are the common ones. The three are the common ones. And so there are different decomposition of the skill. To get a skill part, there are different decomposition. And that would depend on the kind of technology you are using as well. So let me make this fact clear. There are two methods that can be used to measure the distance function. We need to make up that. We've already established. You can use the DEA okay, approach, or you can use the stochastic frontier approach. 
Now for this course, we are not using the stochastic frontier approach. We are going to use the DEA approach. So note that. And next time we meet, what we are going to do is that we're going to take this data set. So take note of this data set. And we are going to type this data set. Please, my advice is that go and type this data set into Excel. Type it into Excel before we come. And we are going to use this data set to demonstrate every little thing, everything we've done today. We're going to do that so that you can understand. Now, if you look at this data set carefully, and we, there's another data set we'll be doing, by the way. Okay. But for this data set, you can see that there is two inputs. And then there is one output. There are two inputs, one output. So what kind of orientation is this? You can tell me. Two inputs. Let me see. Two inputs, one output. Yes. Who can raise your hand and tell me what kind of orientation? Eunice. Yeah, Macle. Input orientation. Okay, input orientation. That's good. So it means that you have input orientation here. So it means that you've got to go and draw this and then type it into Excel, draw it nicely, because I've taught you how to do this job. Draw it nicely, and then we'll come and do it. Once we learn how to do it, okay, you can now practically hands-on learn how to do it. Then we can use R to also do it. But I will not ask you the questions on R. In an exam, I will rather give you the data set, draw it, and then ask you some questions, which we shall do, which I'll do when we now meet next time. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the entire Kabuto.